Hello, everyone. Welcome to the seventh Asia-Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Forum. My name is Hermes, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Am, and we'll be your technical facilitators today. You are at the closing session of the seventh APAN Forum, titled Scaling Up Action. Japanese simultaneous interpretation is available during this session. This feature has already been activated and is available now. To listen in Japanese language, please click the interpretation button in the menu at the bottom of your screen and select Japanese. We will begin in just a moment here, but before we get started, we would like to let you know that this meeting will be recorded for documentation purposes. The chat box is also available in case you have any perspectives you'd like to share or if you need to reach out to me or Am for technical assistance. For those of you just joining us, you are at the session titled the closing of the same APAN forum titled Scaling Up Action. We are ready to get started, so I will now pass the floor to Antoinette Taus, who is a Filipino-American award-winning actress, singer, host, humanitarian, and goodwill ambassador for the United Nations Environment Program. Long a fixture in the entire entertainment industry in the Philippines, she has spent much of her life in the media spotlight and is recognized as one of the most influential role models of the youth of her generation. Today, Antoinette collaborates with various global media groups, such as National Geographic and CNN, on projects centered on important social and environmental issues. She has also founded Communities Organized for Resource Allocation, or CORA, as well as the Sustainable Planet. Antoinette passionately advocates for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, speaking about urgent global challenges pertaining to poverty, plastic pollution, climate change, gender equality, mental health, and sustainability. Antoinette, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hermes. Good afternoon, Your Excellencies, most honorable and distinguished speakers, guests, and heroes for people and the planet. I'm Antonia Toss, honored to be your host and moderator, and grateful to be welcoming you all to the closing plenary session of the seventh APAN Forum. Now, we would graciously like to thank you all for your time, your wisdom, your energy, your passion, and most of all, your heart that you've shared all week long. Thank you for joining us for a hopeful, inspiring, and actionable week of enabling resilience for all as we strengthen the critical decade to scale up action, which is also the central theme of this afternoon's discussion. Resilience was the unifying theme this week for the seventh Upon Forum, and discussions were thoughtfully curated around five centralized enablers. Now, these were climate governance and policy, planning and processes, science and assessment, technologies and practices, and today's earlier discussions on finance and investment, all with a collective goal to enhance resilience and deliver an inclusive resilient society, the resilience of economic sectors, nature-based resilience, and resilience of local communities against the adverse impacts of climate change. And as we speak of resilience outlooks, this week's powerful discussions rent a snapshot of the stream specific aspects of resilience at the regional level, depicting challenges, promising innovations, best practices, as well as priorities for, again, action. And as better understanding is gained with regards to the status of adaptation practices across the region, in-depth discussions are made possible in order to address enhancing resilience holistically as we highlight the intertwined nature of resilience and also take stock of experiences and challenges of building resilience in the context of COVID-19 response and recovery. Now, as we carry with us the knowledge and wisdom gained throughout the week, a great deal of emphasis was placed on ensuring that as we aim to scale up action, there is also much need to focus on both quality and quantity of action, along with the layer of impacts and reach of the actions taken, taking into consideration strategic actions based on case studies in varied locations with localized action, while of course ensuring long-term resilience with a much needed support of both the public and private sectors. We thank each and every one of our distinguished guests and speakers that helped frame the outcome to be presented and discussed during this closing plenary session. 
We would also like to thank everyone that has taken the time and initiative to join us virtually all week long. Only together can our hopes and actions for the world become a reality for those that truly need us and that need you the most. We would also like to thank all of our participants in our mural board activity throughout the week. And just to give you a quick recap, with the aid of an online visual board called Miro, participants were invited to define priorities and make pledges on how to enhance and scale up actions on climate change adaptation, providing outlooks from various perspectives throughout the region. And the main findings, pledges, thoughts, and ideas from this board shall be shared and presented at the end of this session, and we truly look forward to that. Now, as we officially move on to our closing plenary, this session will consist of three separate segments. First will be a presentation of the forum summary, including a set of action-oriented recommendations on how to magnify current efforts on adaptation in the Asia-Pacific region. The second segment of our session shall proceed with a high-level dialogue on how to enhance synergies among different multilateral environmental agreements to bring key messages from the forum forward and disseminate them through other national, regional, and global events. The third and final segment of our closing plenary shall conclude with the showing of continued support of commitments of Afghan partners on how each organization intends to embrace the forum's outcomes through their current work and advance the key recommendations stemming from the forum in the next two years. The session will conclude with a vote of thanks from the APAN Secretariat. Please also stay tuned for some special performances and presentations coming right up. And now as we begin segment one in the presentation of the forum summary, we are honored to have with us Dr. Youssef Nassef, Director of Adaptation for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC, to present this week's forum summary, along with a set of action-oriented recommendations on how to magnify these current efforts on adaptation in the Asia-Pacific region. This will also include commitments of different organizations to advance these recommendations. He has led the adaptation work streams under the UNFCCC since their inception. He possesses over 30 years of experience in diplomacy and international environmental policy and is a seconded diplomat from the Egyptian Foreign Service. While assuming progressively higher levels of leadership at the UNFCCC, he led their support for several initiatives on adaptation. These include the inception and support for national adaptation programs of action and national adaptation plans, the Nairobi Work Program, an international knowledge hub for impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation, and the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage. He recently created the Resilience Frontiers Initiative, which applies foresight for attaining post-2030 resilience. Please welcome, I'm honored to introduce, Dr. Youssef Nassef, Director of Adaptation for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antoinette, and thanks to, to, to the organizers. Um, it's a distinct pleasure for me to be here to present to you the summary of um, this week's APAN session. And if I were to encapsulate um, the deliberations that we went through into just one phrase, it would be that of inclusive transformation. And we will see how this comes about in the different elements of the summary. So if you'd allow me, I will now share my screen. And with this, very good. Um, I think I shared the wrong part. So let me get to the correct one. Yes. So um, this week, I think, uh, as I said, the call for transformation has centered around this recognition of the urgency and call for action. We know that we are in a climate crisis. We know the science has told us that we need to act very quickly within the next few years 
and that a core element of this transformation is that of resilience. And in embarking on that transformation, we have game changers, including youth, including innovation, partnerships and cooperation, and the mobilization of investment. And you may have heard the statement by Mr. Van Ki-moon, which called for a step change, a step change in ambition, in climate finance, in partnership and knowledge ex exchange. And as I go through the five clusters that Antoinette mentioned, um, we go through the messages and the, the step recommendations, as well as the visuals that we've seen from our very able graphic artist, Desiree and her colleagues from Tofu Creators. So, um, here is one of those wonderful graphics that were created from the opening. And, and you can see the keynote statements here, and I will leave you sort of a couple of seconds to look at them, but they are available on the web. And um, in the end, we know that one of the most important steps towards the transformation will be COP26 at the end of this year. And we'll hear about this a bit in our panel discussion that will ensue after this uh, segment. And so in terms of policy and climate governance, I think the main um, uh, messages there, again, center on inclusiveness, a whole of society approach for building resilience, uh, including all stakeholders in decision-making, especially the vulnerable, and also the notion of externalities, of ensuring that across boundaries an action by one community or one country or even one person does not come at the expense of others. It has to be win-win and it can be win-win. And then the strong and uncompromised commitment to the Paris Agreement is central for the transformation towards both climate resilience and climate neutrality, an eventual net zero emissions regime. Um, in terms of step changes, we had, um, a, a, a focus on promoting of systems thinking, which again is an element of that transformation, um, undertaking very clear, concrete, targeted interventions across sectors, across all sectors. The importance again of including all the stakeholders, including the private sector and the institutional capacity that itself in many cases needs to be transformed to enable us to bridge that gap into the next phase of our existence. Now, here is again um, our graphic of, um, of that segment, and you can see the, the, the main messages. Um, if I move again to the next cluster, planning and processes, uh, a very nice statement here, which is that resilience is a journey. It is not a one stop on, um, on, 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 on a set of steps and then it's done. But resilience is something that is a process, it is ongoing, and at the center of it are the people. Um, again, the inclusiveness aspect, people at the center of the planning for resilience, for adaptation, and the processes that implement these plans. And there's a lot of opportunities, and there's a lot of opportunities for leadership, um, including in the context of engaging all the stakeholders in the planning process, and the importance of political will to effect the needed transformation and the necessary leadership for both the planning, for both the resource mobilization and the implementation of, of these plans. Um, in terms of step changes, we know that in a lot of cases, we deal with the different components of development, the different components of resilience in different categories. And we know that the integration across these categories is absolutely necessary to, uh, to enable that holistic transformation that would lead us to the desired state uh, of resilience and hence the breaking of silos. At the same time, we need um, a combination of bottom-up and top-down approaches because as we said, it needs to be inclusive, it needs to be informed by ground level vulnerability and also ground level uh, knowledge, and this can uh, include multi-stakeholder engagement. And as we said, um, the breaking of silos will also be commensurate with the mainstreaming of climate change into development planning and into uh, budgeting. And again, our wonderful graphics from Tofu Creatives on this segment. In terms of science and assessment, when I started, I said that the science has informed us of 
the need for transformation, both from the climate change side, and we've seen the IPCC reports on warming of 1.5, but also IBIS from the biodiversity side. And both um, of these scientific contexts have told us of the need for rapid transformation in the coming years. And this transformation has to be informed by the science. And uh, the importance of bottom-up innovation has been repeatedly uh, emphasized, as well as the integration of science and assessment in a multidisciplinary um, way, not just multidisciplinary within a country, but also across countries. And th there comes the importance of regional collaboration and transboundary action. And, and so um, the, the whole notion again of transformation and of multi-stakeholder engagement comes in to our systemic change context and the need for coordination in order to ensure that, um, that this transformation happens in a way that engages all those that need to be engaged and takes account of all levels and all stakeholders. And in terms of the step changes for this cluster, again, user centricity is key and research that is action oriented, again, a stakeholder engagement. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, movement now to understand um, how behavioral science can help us uh, address action and address vulnerabilities in a way that is context specific and takes account of what exactly are the keys to enable us to um, uh, transition our behavior towards a sustainable world. And hence social and behavioral science are key here. Again, transboundary risk, we have talked about that uh, in order for one part of the world to take actions that ensure that it, they, they do not affect negatively another part, not just one part of the world and another, but even within countries and within communities and at all levels, really. Um, so this is the graphic for science and assessment. And as I move forward now to technologies and practices, and we have already mentioned the role of innovation before and the role of science. So, um, the idea here is to broaden our understanding of value. And capital is not just about money, not just about assets, but there's also the natural and human capital. And we've heard of very recent reports that have tackled this issue head on and, um, and, and, and led us to a better understanding of how we can value assets that are not um, distinctly considered economic in the traditional sense. And in that sense, when we talk about innovation and technology, we have to ensure that they take account of, um, of this type of, of broad understanding of capital in its application of innovation and disruption. Again, the, the context specificness is key. One size does not fit all and the engagement of all actors in the development and diffusion of technology and in innovation which takes account of intergenerational equity. It's not just about tomorrow or next week, but many generations to come as we create value through technology. And again, the cross disciplinary learning, which um, uh, goes back to the silo uh, issue that we raised before and, and the importance of engaging um, all stakeholders and learning can come from very different sources, not just from, from universities and classes, but from indigenous peoples, traditional knowledge, and many um, other sources. Uh, in terms of the step changes that were identified here, again, uh, bottom-up has been highlighted, and you'll see this recurring, and user centricity, context specificness, and um, the active need to support the strengthening of innovation and cooperation. So we go through the whole value chain all the way from R&D till final uh, diffusion of innovation and technology. And again, here is the graphic that encapsulates these ideas um, from Tofu Creatives. In terms of finance and investment, um, we, we have seen, again, the need for uh, an enhancement of um, financial flows with the recognition that climate change is evolving rapidly. And um, we, we've heard in the past year that even though uh, COVID-19 has 
uh, has locked us down, climate change did not get locked down and it's still advancing. And the, the, the message that there is a need to ensure that the funds that are provided reach all levels, especially the vulnerable communities and ground level. And the scaling up is not just about amount of resources, but about the quality, the nature, accessibility, um, uh, and, and the long-term orientation, um, the synergy with, with development, the need to broaden the sources of support, so more private investment, more sources. And we've learned a lot in this past year through the COVID-19 crisis, which has given us an opportunity to better understand transformation and perhaps better accept it. Um, and this can be done through the revitalization of partnerships and uh, cooperations. In terms of the step uh, changes and actions, we've heard of the need uh, again to integrate climate change uh, into development finance and private sector investment, let climate change considerations permeate into all aspects of decision making that lead to financial flows. Uh, again, long term horizons, and you know, one of the, the, uh, the specific attributes of cost benefit analysis is that costs and benefits in the future are worth less than the present. So this has to be an adjustment in our thinking in order to ensure long termism and ensure intergenerational equity at the same time, providing assistance upfront, not too late, because we know that the, the sooner we act, um, the less we will have to suffer afterwards. Preemptive action is always a priority and enhance our understanding of how funding works on the incremental costs and benefits associated with climate change. So this is my short summary. And um, uh, I'm, I'm very, very honored to now uh, present you a surprise, actually. Um, our distinguished MC has been introduced by Hermes uh, in the opening. But um, uh, I would like to um, highlight that uh, Antoinette is quite an active advocate for sustainability. She has a very famous quote that every single action creates a ripple effect. Nothing is too small. And every one of us has the power to make the world better. Antoinette has also um, told us that when, when one is passionate about their work, they become addicted to it. And Antoinette is addicted to the SDGs and for advocating sustainability. And I have the pleasure now to present you again, Antoinette, with a surprise because she will be singing for us and rapping a song that is totally centered on the SDGs, her passion. So with this, ladies and gentlemen, I hand back to the very talented Antoinette Taus. Antoinette, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, um, Dr. Nassif. Um, I actually lost you for a few minutes and I missed your wonderful introduction, but I'm so, so, so grateful um, for this opportunity to once again share um, the SDG song. And uh, the wonderful story behind this is that at the sixth Apan, um, Babu <laughs> had requested um, for a musical number and had found out that with my passion for the SDGs, I had ended up creating a rap about it uh, just to remember all 17. And with that, I had merged it with a beautiful song called One Day. And um, I'd like to share it with all of you again today. And I would like to thank, of course, the Afghan Secretariat, uh, Babu and Dr. Nasef, of course, uh, for this opportunity. And this goes out to all of you heroes and champions of the earth. Thank you for all that you do for people in the planet. <clears throat> Sometimes I'm joy, and thank God for everything. I'm so, I am here. 
Across the world, feel the hunger of every boy and girl. Good at home being coast to coast. Quality education we need the most. Gender equality for all to see. Clean water, sanitation, clean energy. Decent work, economic growth. Industry, infrastructure, innovation. Reduced inequalities for every nation. Sustainable cities and communities. Responsible production and consumption, please. Climate action, that's the plan. Protect the water and life on land. Peace, justice, strong institutions. That's for the goal of that solution. Spread the good work. Move the land. That's the year human beings won't live in fear. Calling all earth executive. It's time to take action. And if you care, hand in hand, together we can. 17 goals, one master plan. Change very much. Thank you so much once again. And um, your excellencies, um, distinguished guests, we move on to segment two <laughs> of our high level closing plenary. Thank you so much once again to Dr. Youssef Nasef, Director for Adaptation for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change for sharing this week's forum summary. And with that, this second segment, this session, will be presenting a summary of the forum, including a set of action-oriented recommendations on how to magnify current efforts on adaptation in the Asia-Pacific region, and of course, provide the basis 
for the Asia Pacific region contributions to the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference COP26 in Glasgow, United Kingdom, and the 2021 United Nations Biodiversity Conference COP15 in Kunming, China, and the World Food Summit in Rome, Italy, among other stakeholders, representatives from key UN conventions related to climate, biodiversity, and desertification are invited to discuss the relevance of the outcomes of the 7th Alpine Forum in the global arena and how to move these forums recommendations forward in the next two years as we approach the 8th Alpine. Now, key points that will be recognized during this discussion will be what will each of our panelists take from this forum to their own area of the world, to their own field, to their own spectrum? We also would like to put the spotlight on action-oriented recommendations and messages in relevance to the enablers that we presented. And of course, there will be a spotlight on how each enabler will enhance the resilience of the community. For this high-level closing plenary session, I'm honored to introduce our most distinguished panel beginning with Mrs. Elizabeth Maruma Mrema, Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD. Mrs. Elizabeth Maruma Mrema has worked with the UN Environment Program for over two decades and has served in various roles, including as Director of the Law Division, Deputy Director of the Ecosystems Division, and Executive Secretary of the Secretariat of the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals. Before joining UNEP, Mrs. Mrema worked with Tanzania's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation and left as a counselor and senior legal counsel. Mrs. Mrema's work at UNEP has focused on the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws at national, regional, and international levels. Our next panelist, we are honored to have with us Dr. Bambang Susantono, Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development, Asian Development Bank, ADB, notably the first Indonesian in this position. Dr. Susantono is responsible for managing knowledge in ADB and coordinating researches and studies on various topics such as energy, transport, education, health, finance, urban, and also cross-cutting nexus themes such as climate change, governance, gender, social development, environment, rural development, and food security, and regional cooperation. He also coordinates ADB annual flagship publications such as the Asian Development Outlook, Key Indicators of Asia Pacific, and Asian Regional Economic Integration Report. Prior to this, Dr. Susantono was the Acting Minister and Vice Minister of Transportation of Indonesia and Deputy Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development at the Office of Coordinating Ministry for Economic Affairs. Thank you, Tanel. I enjoy your scene. Thank you very much, Dr. Susantono. We are also honored to have with us today, Mr. Oves Sarmad, Deputy Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC. Mr. Ove Sarma joined the United Nations Climate Change Secretariat in 2017 and supports the Executive Secretary in managing the UNFCCC Secretariat and its staff, advising on a range of issues relating to the strategic operations planning and development of the organization. Previously, he served as Chief of Staff to the Director General at the International Organization for Migration, IOM, in Geneva. Mr. Sarmad worked in several management and policy capacities in IOM over a period of 27 years. Prior to the IOM, he worked in the private and public sectors in London, where he qualified as a Chartered Management Accountant and Chartered Global Management Accountant. Yeah, it's a great I'm... pleasure for me to join you, Antoinette. Very good to see you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sarma. The honor is mine. We are also honored to have with us this afternoon, Ms. Tina Bernpilly, Deputy Executive Secretary of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, UNCCD. 
Before assuming her current position, she served as the executive secretary of the Vienna Convention for the Protection of the Ozone Layer and its Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer. Ms. Burnpilly has had over 25 years of experience in policy analysis and implementation on sustainable development related issues and management at all levels of governance. She is a former Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Change in Greece. And prior to joining the Ozone Secretariat in 2013, she served as Ambassador of Greece to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris. Throughout her career, she has been engaged in issues across various platforms related to the environment and sustainable development. And last, but certainly not the least, we are honored to have with us His Excellency Ken O'Flaherty, COP26 Regional Ambassador to Asia Pacific and South Asia. His Excellency Ken O'Flaherty works closely with governments, business, and civil society across the region to boost climate action ahead of the COP26 Leaders Summit, which will take place in Glasgow in November 2021. Ken has recently returned from a posting as minister in Rome and has experience in a number of foreign office departments. He has previously served in the British Embassy in Tokyo and Paris, as well as the former UK representation to the European Union. His Excellency Ken has worked on a wide range of issues from climate change and energy to economic, EU cooperation, security, counterterrorism, and migration issues. With that, we formally welcome once again our distinguished panel members, and we shall proceed with our first question, which is directed, of course, to Mrs. Elizabeth Marumamrera, Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Mrs. Mrema, the 15th meeting of the CBD COP, or COP15, aims to adopt a post 2020 Global Biodiversity Framework as a stepping stone towards the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. Now you have heard the forum summary and key recommendations. Um, what would you say your key take home messages are from here to the road to Kunming and then from Kunming to the Climate COP in November, 2021? Mrs. Rema. First, let me uh, use this opportunity, uh, Antoinette, to thank you uh, for leading us and more so for the inspirational song you have given us. I think now every time I talk and remember about sustainable development goals, I will be remembering that song and that will bring back memories to me. I thank the APAN Secretariat for organizing this event. Yusuf, you have given us excellent uh, a summary of what has happened uh, the whole week, much as I could not attend all the sessions, but I'm delighted now that uh, I have a better view of what was discussed and the outcomes, and probably even learned more as the result. So Yusuf, thank you uh, very much. And thanks my other dear panelists uh, joining each one of us uh, in this conversation. The question you have posed is very important because ourselves at the Secretariat of Convention on Biological Diversity, we work together with our sister Rio conventions and here I have the uh, Climate Change Secretariat, the Decertification Secretariat, I see my colleagues with me to really build synergy and create momentum for nature climate and land as we move to our triple cops, hopefully towards the end of uh, the year. And while the five key enablers discussed during this forum and you yourself summarized them very well at the beginning are extremely important. The Convention on Biological Diversity Parties have discussed these similar topics regarding to finance, technology, governance and planning during the informal sessions actually going on exactly during this week by our two subsidiary bodies. Last week with science, this week and later today we'll have 
on implementation, discussing these very pertinent issues. And there are two main takeaways that I would like to highlight emerging out of these ongoing discussions. First, for the Asia and Pacific region specifically, the region is extremely, as we all know, vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, building resilience through nature-based solutions being critical. In 2020, the Asia Pacific region faced a record number of climate related disasters that coupled unfortunately with the COVID-19 pandemic affected tens of millions of vulnerable people. A green recovery focused on nature-based solutions can inevitably advance the climate smart recovery that could strengthen social, economic and ecological resilience. The pandemic we know has also highlighted the connection between healthy nature and human health and livelihood and has equally provided us with the global community, provided the global community with an opportunity to address climate change, biodiversity loss and land degradation by taking a common approach. So we all need to seize this opportunity. Secondly, a strong governance systems and institutions will play a key role in the successful implementation of the commitments, including our post-2020 global biodiversity framework. A fact which also Yusuf underlined coming out of the whole week discussion during this forum. It is critical that in, uh, it's important to strengthen the multilateral cooperation, build synergies, including among ourselves, the Rio conventions for global governance on the environment. And this will require a global coordination, but also coordination among and through regional networks and at equally at national level. In this regard, the development and uptake of tools and resources for mainstreaming across national plans and policies and sectorial strategies becomes critical and essential. Let me take one specific example. Land degradation neutrality target setting, and Tina will, can talk about that more than myself. So that target setting process under the decertification convention and the national biodiversity strategic and act, strategies and action plans and our convention on biological diversity can represent a strong avenue or strong venue for the promotion of integrated planning and synergetic implementation at country level that can deliver global benefits. Like, la, uh, likewise, national adaptation plans and national determined contribution under the Climate Change Convention also feature nature-based solutions to climate issues, all of which also have uh, core benefits to biodiversity and land degradation. So uh, Antoinette, I may finish actually, or let me finish by uh, recalling a specific quote from uh, Das Gupta review report and Ken might know it well uh, than many of us, that the solutions start with understanding and accepting a simple truth. And what is this truth? Our economies are embedded within nature and not external to nature. So the time has come to really make that transition to a new economic and social paradigm that values nature for people, planet, and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Mrema, Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And thank you for those beautiful words. And as you said, um, you would have Miss Tina Bernpilli continue on the point that you had mentioned. And with that, my next question is actually for Miss Tina Bernpilli in connection with what Mrs. Mrema has just said. And we'd also like to hear uh, in connection to this question, her reaction to the forum summary as well. 
Um, it, the question is interaction of land and climate is complex. Now, globally average land surface air temperature has risen faster than the global mean surface temperature. It will exacerbate several desertification processes and higher land and soil degradation. What are key actions UNCCD is embarking on for the UN decade of ecosystem restoration, specifically in the Asia Pacific region, managing land and soil toward building resilience of vulnerable communities. And once again, we welcome Ms. Tina Byrne-Pilly, Deputy Executive Secretary of the United Nations Convention to combat desertification. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a distinct pleasure to be among colleagues, friends, and thank you very much to the APAN Secretary for, for, uh, for having the UNCCD with you today. Antoinette, I think I would like to start by saying that no matter what we do and no matter how we plan in our conventions, if you don't have what you mentioned, passion and heart, we will not be successful. So I really feel that uh, uh, we are all passionate and we are all collectively looking for the global good. Now, let me be very simple by saying that land is life. Um, land can both reduce emissions if you manage it and if you use it sustainably, but it's also a sink and it can sequester emissions if the, line, the land itself is alive. It can also support biodiversity because on land, uh, animals and plants can thrive. Uh, in the beginning, I think Youssef mentioned the notion of inclusive transformation and Elizabeth alluded to it. So the UNCCD tries to bring all these elements on the table, the mitigation, the adaptation, biodiversity, but also the possibility of jobs, because you cannot have environmental solutions unless you address the social and economic challenges that people face under the context of land degradation neutrality targets and programs. Now, land degradation neutrality, it's a very, it's a very difficult notion to understand because it tries to say something positive in a negative way, right? Being neutral. But basically, it means that we shouldn't do further harm to land, and we should start. We should start to recover to recover land that has been lost, the deserted land that has been lost. So the land degradation neutrality is an international framework which countries have endorsed. Of course, all targets are voluntary. Till 2030, there is uh, one billion hectares of land that countries have committed to restore. And in Asia Pacific, uh, specifically 23 countries have already set their land degradation neutrality targets and many more are, are going to do so. So the UNCCD is really trying to work with all these parties, with all these countries in order to develop the national land degradation plans. Now, the big challenge that we have and I'm really looking forward to listen to also what the Asian Development Bank will say is how you scale up. You know, we have a project in one country, but what about regional projects? I think we need to move, as we have said, not only breaking silence among the different issues, the different environmental issues, but also trying to breaking the borders and, and target land as one uh, across borders. So I will stop here and I would like to thank you once more. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Bernpilly. And um, with that, um, Ms. Bernpilly had actually mentioned the interest in hearing um, the views and insights as well and the message from the ADB. So we'd like to direct the, this conversation to Dr. Bambang Susantono, Vice President for Knowledge Management Asian Development Bank. And we would like to ask Dr. Susantono, ADB has led the APAN stream on economic sector resilience. Now, based on the discussions at the forum, and as what Ms. Bermpilly has also just mentioned, what would be or what should be some of the priorities for the Asia Pacific region for scaling up adaptation in economic sectors? Dr. Susantono? 
thank you very much, Tonet, and a great pleasure to join this important event. And I will also join other colleagues to thank for a memorable song you just sang. I think the discussions on the economic sector resilience was very engaging with participation from a wide range of stakeholders, including from indigenous community, grassroots women organization, and the youth. A discussion on economics is very broad and touches many dimensions. The sessions discuss economic resilience building in a wide range of sectors like agriculture, tourism, SME, small and medium enterprise, trade and commerce, and infrastructure. So let me highlight just three key priorities. The first priority is to turn COVID-19 recovery into an opportunity to promote resilient economic growth. All countries in Asia and the Pacific have been badly hit by the pandemic. As countries plan their recovery, returning to the old normal will not be an option. We need not look further than today's, today's climate crisis to understand that. Economic re recovery from COVID-19 should also proactively integrate climate resilience considerations. Such a direction is in line with the priorities of the UK-led COP26, which is to promote green, inclusive, and resilient recovery. Second priority is on the scenario-based long-term planning. Strengthening economic resilience requires long-term planning based on scenario that factor in a range of climate-related climate and other uncertainties. Long-term planning will help us develop policies and also allocate resources which are proportionate to the climate risk and opportunity. Such planning should also enable us to identify the shift needed in our economy in the face of a changing climate. They include new jobs and skills, new solutions on green infrastructure and new financial products targeted at small hardware farmers and small and medium sized enterprise, for example. The third is on a holistic system approach for economic resilience. No economy functions in isolations. We all know that one. The most different set of economy are very closely linked with each other and have a global to local level influences. We have seen in climate risk in one sector of our supply chains having devastating impacts on other sectors within the chain or even other countries. For example, the impact of the 2011 Thailand floods was not confined to the automobile industry within Thailand, but extended all the way to the supply chains in other countries like Japan. So we need to adopt a holistic system approach in strengthening economic resilience. Such an approach will help us identify interconnected risks and shape holistic responses to physical, ecological, social, institutional, and financial resilience. So let me stop there. Thank you very much, Dr. Susantono. And with that, we would like to um, direct our conversation to His Excellency Ken O'Flaherty, COP26 Regional Ambassador to Asia Pacific and South Asia. Now, as we've heard from our most distinguished panel and their responses um, to the initial questions in the forum summary, we'd also like to ask you that adaptation and resilience and nature campaigns are two major campaigns that COP26 presidencies running. Now, what three top recommendations would you advocate to society, youth, uh, stakeholders, and decision makers as they prepare to come together at the COP26, as well as convene at the COP15 CBD this year? Your Excellency. Good afternoon, Antoinette, and greetings to everyone from the COP26 presidency. I think my top recommendation is probably one which emerged from the presentation of findings of this uh, forum, um, which you just gave uh, earlier today. It's very much about understanding the importance of a whole of society approach to major global issues, including biodiversity loss and climate change, because so much of successful adaptation and resilience is in local solutions. There's obviously a role for high level policymaking at a state level, but I think we are convinced this must be complementary to local efforts. And so as presidency, we're going to work to ensure that the run up to COP26 and the event itself takes a genuinely inclusive approach to supporting the most impactful UNFCCC processes possible. We want to be championing inclusivity and we want to use our position as presidency to empower and amplify all voices, not just those of decision makers, but also those of civil society, of youth, of indigenous groups, of women, and so forth. We've designed all of our COP26 campaigns, especially on adaptation 
resilience and nature with this in mind. And so while decision makers will convene in China for COP15, as we've heard, and then in Glasgow for COP26 later this year, our campaigns intend to prioritize climate action occurring in the real economy, recognizing the impact that businesses, civil society, youth, and other stakeholders have. And, and perhaps a second aspect of this would be that to come complement the Adaptation Action Coalition, which our Prime Minister launched earlier this year, our Race to Resilience campaign will mobilize businesses, cities, civil society and investors in strengthening the resilience of 4 billion people in vulnerable communities by 2030. The Race to Resilience will be focusing on helping frontline communities build resistance and adapt to the impacts of climate change, and that will include things like extreme heat, drought, flooding and sea level rise. And I hope to see many businesses, cities, civil society and investors from across the Asia Pacific region join that campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency Kenneth Barden. Um, truly as someone from the Philippines, um, uh, that is really inspiring, hopeful um, to hear. So thank you very much um, for that response. And we'd actually like to turn the conversation over now to the UNFCCC, um, to Mr. Oves Samad, Deputy Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Mr. Samad, um, we know that removing knowledge barriers for adaptation is seen not only as an essential catalyst for adaptation, but also as a low hanging fruit with significant benefits for adaptation practitioners. What are your views on this, Mr. Sarman? Again, thank you very much, uh, uh, Antoinette. And it's a great pleasure for me to participate in, on behalf of my organization, UNFCCC. And great to see colleagues from ADB, uh, COP presidency, and our two sister uh, conventions, as we call them, uh, CCD and CBD. It's a real, uh, real honor. Thank you very much. And Antoinette, I really enjoyed that song. It was wonderful. And uh, we will uh, make sure that we'll play it at uh, different occasions and remember that. Maraming, maraming salamat. Maraming salamat. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I had some time in Philippines, so uh, that brings uh, some nice memories. Anyway, listen. Uh, I think you all know uh, the importance of what we are talking about in terms of adaptation, and that what, that is a central part of implementing Paris Agreement. And on Paris Agreement, what we say to 2015 was a historic year in adopting the Paris Agreement, which which was transformative in terms of uh, bringing the world together in a in a very highly ambitious manner to address climate change, but we also strongly believe that adaptation, ad no, sorry, adoption is not implementation. Now, implementation is what we are trying to focus now this year, in particular this year uh, uh, at the COP26, and we want to finish all the remaining aspects of the Paris Agreement, so we need to uh, really focus on that. And the cent central piece of Paris Agreement, as you all know that are the nationally determined contributions, which are at the heart of achieving the long-term goals. And NDC embody the efforts by each country to reduce national emissions uh, and adapt to the impact of climate change. So every five years, uh, there is a global uh, stock take that will collectively assess these efforts so that our parties can ensure that successive NDCs become progressively more ambitious over time. And the National Adaptation Plan, as my colleague and friend uh, Youssef mentioned, or the NAPs are the country plans that catalyze implementation of adaptation. So the wider adaptation community addresses here, addressed here at the APAN forum has contributed technical guides and adapt on adaptation, along with other partners. And the National Adaptation Plan for countries in Asia Pacific region can draw on such resources to include measures to reduce vulnerability to climate impacts. So those are just my initial thoughts, but we'll come back to uh, as a follow-up to that discussion. Back to you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Samad. We'd like to direct the conversation back to the Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD. Mrs. Mrema, while ecosystems play a key role in the global carbon cycle and in adaptation to climate change, climate change is adversely affecting ecosystems and biodiversity. Now, the Strategic Plan for Biodiversity 2011 to 2020 and the IG Target 15 aim to restore at least 15% of degraded ecosystems. Now, going into the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, what actions are countries committing to address the urgency for nature and climate change resilience solutions? Mrs. Mrema? Thank you very much. Indeed, there's no question that we face complex and interconnected challenges. And yet we have seen that countries are actually in fact stepping up their commitments. And I would like again to give uh, examples. If we go back to our fifth global biodiversity outlook uh, launched last year in September, it assessed progress made uh, towards each biodiversity targets and indicated that Although progress towards uh, target 15 uh, on restoration has been limited, ambitious restoration programs are either underway or are being proposed in many parts or regions of the world. And these, if they continue, have the potential to deliver significant gains in ecosystems resilience and preservation of carbon so uh, stocks. Again, uh, Global Biodiversity Outlook also highlighted that many of the national determined contributions made under the Paris Agreement also contribute to Target 15, with 75% of the NDCs containing forest-related targets, including restoration activities. Going even further, the UN Summit uh, on biodiversity last year in September, provided uh, an indication of how important the issue of biodiversity has become globally. Uh, and we, this was demonstrated by the number of high level speakers that participated, including the number of uh, heads of state and government over 70, who spoke highlighting the agents of action in support of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. In particular, the summit showed how politically important biodiversity had become at high level and also served as a reminder to the international community that preservation and restoration of biodiversity ecosystems offer an important opportunity for shared progress during this UN decade of action. Furthermore, commitments like the ones made at the leaders pledge for nature, which currently over 84 countries have signed, 12 of which are from the Asia Pacific region, further demonstrate how countries are ready to redouble their efforts to address the interconnectedness of biodiversity loss, land and ocean degradation and climate change, which also Ken had underlined. So let me also highlight the commitments made by non-start actors, the governments of China and Egypt, who are our previous conference of the parties host and upcoming host, with the support of the secretariat in spearheading an initiative at the last conference of the COP known as Shama Sheng uh, to Kuming Action Agenda for Nature and People. This initiative showcases voluntary commitments and raises awareness on the urgency to reduce the drivers of biodiversity loss and shift towards nature positive outcomes within this decade. I'm equally actually pleased to see enhanced regional cooperation with countries sharing experiences and showing casing solutions through the platform like the Appan Forum to safeguard our critical areas of ecosystems health for improved resilience among issue, other issues related to our post 2020 global biodiversity framework. So we are all there, international cooperation, uh, regional cooperation, 
upscaling of actions to really contribute to the post-2020 framework during this decade. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mrema. And as we speak of urgency, uh, we'd like to turn this back to UNCCD. Ms. Bernpili, let me mention one of the recent messages from the Executive Secretary of the UNCCD. Bioenergy and land-based mitigation are not silver bullets, but they will buy us some time. As such, they must be part of the broader response to climate change. Now the next decade may be our last chance to get the land working for everyone. Uh, Ms. Bernpili, can you elaborate on it and why buying time is extremely important? Thank you very much, Antoinette. Um, let me start by saying that we have been living in the last one year and a half under very unprecedented circumstances with lots of grief and, uh, and pain to many families due to COVID. But the response to COVID has shown us four things. One, that science matters. So the importance of science has been tremendous. The second, the importance of government action. The third one, the importance of public support. And the fourth one, in terms of policy, the ability to learn and adjust on a very, very sort of daily even basis. I think we need to move that framework to climate change action as well. And we all need to move together. Uh, basically what uh, Ibrahim Sia, our executive secretary said, it's that we don't have time and we need to act now. Most nations, uh, many nations are targeting carbon neutrality. We have very, very ambitious plans that will be coming in, in 30 years time. A and these are all very, very welcomed because they are going to, to end up in this inclusive transformation that Youssef was mentioning in the beginning. But we also need to find actions and emissions cuts in all possible ways at this point in time. Uh, Elizabeth mentioned that nature-based solutions, including land uh, restoration, can provide us a lot of, uh, actually, I think it's 37% of the emission reductions that we need by 2030 in order to keep the temperature below two. But, and obviously, if we have the 1 billion of hectares of land restored by 2030, then we have uh, even, more, um, even more sort of margin and space for, for mitigation. But I want to say something very openly. Land can realistically contribute to a portion of the mitigation and the action that is needed, a portion of the carbon dioxide that we can remove from the atmosphere. We definitely need strong action in decarbonizing our economies. And there is no one solution that will fit the problem. We need to take multiple solutions in many different sectors, and we need to break the silos, as we've said in the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Bernpilly of UNCCD. And speaking of different solutions and varied solutions, we would like to turn back to Mr. Sarmad of the UNFCCC. Mr. Sarmad, how does the context of loss and damage and post-disaster interventions feature in the UNFCCC process? Thank you, Antoinette, again. Uh, well, on loss and damage, it as all, was also mentioned, uh, it's under the Warsaw International Mechanism. And let me give you a bit of context. Uh, efforts under our process aim to assist the vulnerable communities and countries to undertake responses along a spectrum, a broad spectrum, as also mentioned by Tina, uh, one, one, there is no one solution. From, preemptive to contingency to uh, preparation and so on. Climate impacts are unfolding more rapidly and with increasingly immediate risks to people and the livelihood than previously anticipated. As I also mentioned, the development of measures to preempt risks, plans, and risk by creating the national adaptation plans and put appropriate contingency measures in place can avert and minimize the adverse air climate impacts. In our process, what we strongly believe are that 
contingency measure, measures which exemplify the responsibility of the international community to not just contribute to humanitarian interventions, but also to support the risk reduction and management. And these are addressed through the loss and damage under, the, under our process. This mechanism specifically seeks to manage risks that are not addressed through preemptive instruments like NAMS. It is a complementary component to planned adaptation, which is, which is essential to scaling up adaptation and to adopt a comprehensive outlook towards risk management. And under this work stream in our, sec in our secretariat and the process of log loss and damage, we are dealing with a variety of aspects of comprehensive risk management, including issues like displacement due to climate change, addressing slow onset events, assessing non-economic losses and seeking innovative ways to support actions to address contingency measures for loss and damage. And as I said in my first intervention, all of this is a work in progress, and this year's COP is really a, uh, I think, a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to really scale up and uh, conclude many of these uh, aspects of the process and decisions that is needed. So we very much look forward to it. And then this APAN forum is a really, uh, I believe, a meaningful, timely uh, getting together of uh, different perspectives and uh, various colleagues representing different organizations. So uh, the outcomes of this will be very meaningful and will be uh, amplifying those. Back to your internet. Thank you very much, Mr. Samad, UNF Triple C. And speaking of COP26, we'd like to turn this back to His Excellency Ken O'Flaherty, COP26 Regional Ambassador to Asia Pacific and South Asia. Um, climate change, as the forum has reiterated, as we've been discussing this past hour, um, is affecting and impacting all of us, people, biodiversity, land, economy, and so much more. Now, what is the UK's plan as COP26 presidency to mobilize the COP members to scale up actions on the ground to build resilience, specifically in Asia Pacific? Is that true? Great question. Um, so I would say even if we stopped emissions rising today, the world would still need to deal with significant climate disruption. So adapting to climate impacts is crucial as we see those worsen. Climate change is affecting lives li and livelihoods across the Asia-Pacific region. It's reshaping economies, landscapes, communities. Impacts are already being felt across the region. And as we've noted already, the most vulnerable communities are being hit the hardest. So in my role as COP26 regional ambassador, I've seen how the Asia Pacific region is already dealing with the real world impacts of climate change. Across the region, many heavily populated areas sit very close to sea level. And so with long coastlines, highly vulnerable um, communities are vulnerable to flooding, natural disasters, typhoons, and tsunamis. The Philippines, of course, has an average of 20 typhoons every year, which impacts agriculture, health, infrastructure. And we all know that late last year, the island of Luzon was devastated by super typhoon Goni and typhoon Bamco less than a week apart. In Vietnam, we're seeing sea level rises and rising temperatures, which are contributing potentially to 40% of flooding of the Mekong Delta, on which 30 million people rely on for their livelihoods. So adaptation and resilience actions across the Asia Pacific region are urgently needed at all levels, and that's regional, national and local with an explicit focus on the most vulnerable and the most marginalized. And I really appreciated that message coming from the APAN forum um, today. This is going to be a big priority for the UK in coming months as we're preparing for COP26 with our international partners. We want to use that summit to accelerate resilience to the evolving climate and weather extremes. Under our presidency, in partnership with Italy, we want to deliver the ambition set out in Paris five years ago and set international action on adaptation as a priority through driving greater political ambition and by working together to translate that into practical commitments. We want to use our presidency to deliver on three core internationally focused areas. We want to improve preparedness for climate related disasters and supporting national adaptation planning. We want to mobilize and advance adaptation action. 
and we want to increase the availability, efficiency and accessibility of adaptation finance. Now, on the 25th of January at the Climate Adaptation Summit, the UK Prime Minister launched the Adaptation Action Coalition to mobilise action on adaptation ahead of COP26. This is building on the UNCAS call for action on adaptation resilience and compels us to transform this political commitment into tangible action on the ground. I'm pleased to say many countries across the Asia Pacific region have endorsed the UNCAS call for action, and I hope that all of those countries will join us on the Adaptation Action Coalition. It will be an opportunity for countries, developed and developing, to work together on local, regional and national uh, glo global adaptation solutions. It also presents an opportunity to showcase the best practices in adaptation and resilience and highlighting adaptation solutions we want to scale up. Now, finally, um, we will be hosting the Climate Development Ministerial later this month on the 31st of March. While the Climate Ambition Summit in December showed we're making progress to reduce emissions, it's clear there's a lot more that we need to do. Countries have to go further urgently and no country can be left behind. Without the opportunity to deliver climate action that creates jobs, cuts emissions and protects us from climate change impacts. This event will be a virtual event. It will bring together ministers to identify practical next steps to progress action on a series of key issues, responding to climate act, uh, impacts, fiscal space and debt, access to finance, mobilizing finance, and it will shape the agenda around these issues in other international fora through to COP26. I'm really pleased that there's many countries from the Asia Pacific region participating, including Bangladesh, Fiji, the Philippines, India, Bhutan, Tuvalu, India, and China. And in conclusion, I'd like to urge all countries across the Asia Pacific region to do more to prepare for climate change. Action needs to be well informed, it needs to be coordinated, and it needs to be sustained. And that will require adaptation resilience, receiving greater political attention and national plans that enable engagement from the local to the national level. Thank you. Thank you very much, His Excellency Ken O'Flaherty. And thank you so much for mentioning and emphasizing the plight of vulnerable communities and for mentioning the Philippines and countries like ours across the world that are experiencing the impacts of climate change. And speaking of vulnerable communities, I'd like to direct the conversation to Mrs. Mrema of CBD. What integrated approaches by all stakeholders can accelerate solutions that address both the nature and the climate crisis? How will the youth, society at large, and the vulnerable be supported to have their voice heard? Mrs. Mema? Thank you very much. The past year has taught us many lessons and we cannot forget that. One lesson has been the interconnectedness between na of nature of our natural systems, how it resonates throughout our social and economic systems. And that means that the challenges like biodiversity loss or climate change or land degradation, the drivers of which are all interconnected must be addressed, all of them together. So while the post 2020 global biodiversity framework will play a significant role in promoting ecosystem-based approaches to climate change, we need to ensure that climate solutions are implemented with biodiversity safeguards in mind to avoid trade-offs. And simply talking about integrated approaches is not enough. The mission lies ahead of us, requires that all actors play the active and important role. All voices from all actors are important. And our Convention on Biological Diversity has a long tradition of working with women, youth, farmers, small holders, private sector, et cetera, and undertake or to undertake activities to ensure fully and informed participation of also indigenous uh, peoples and local communities in our processes. Focusing on the youth in particular, the voices of the youth we all know are becoming louder and louder and stronger. And my colleague, Climate Change, can write a book uh, on that. What is happening? Uh, the youth pressure at national level, demonstrating, holding placards, 
getting into the courts, etc. And I stand personally with them, not only as recipients of our decision making processes, but more so as important agents of change. And therefore providing the youth with the right resources for adopting sustainable lifestyles, enabling them to conserve and sustainably use biodiversity and for climate action and facilitating their participation in decision-making process are just some of the ways we can support them to ensure that their voices are equally heard. The active participation of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network in the development of our post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, as well as the active engagement in different issues under the convention subsidiary bodies are just few and very positive examples of the hard work and commitment of our youth. And I believe all our processes with the other sister Rio conventions do engage the youth because we all understand the youth are the leaders of tomorrow. All of us in this panel, we have played our role. We have contributed to the pollution uh, we are experiencing, to the biodiversity loss, to the climate change, to land degradation. But our youth are the ones who will actually take action on the ground of the decisions we take today. So we need them on the negotiation table to them to own these decisions and be able to take leadership role and take action in the future when all of us probably will have disappeared from this earth or will have retired. I stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mrema. And as we run out of time for this discussion, we actually had a list of other questions that we wanted to ask you. Um, but of course, we'll be coming together again. We have one final question. Um, we will direct this to Dr. Susantono. And we would like to ask, resilience is a central theme of ADB's 2030. Now, what are the key resilience-related priorities for ADB as we move towards COP26? Thank you, Tonette. One of our ADB strategy 2037 operational priorities is on tackling climate change, building climate and disaster resilience, and enhancing environmental sustainability. Uh, we have set ambitious climate finance targets of 80 billion in 2030 from our own resources to support our developing member countries to achieve their climate priorities. As we move toward COP26, ADB sets three key climate adaptation priorities. First is to increase adaptation capacity at all levels. We call it a three-prong approach of regional, national, and local levels. Recognizing that climate actions are regional public goods, ADB at the regional level is working with regional organizations such as the South Asia Cooperative Environment Program to promote dialogue on green and resilient COVID-19 recovery. It is also collaborating with the Ministry of Environment Japan on its Asia Pacific Adaptation Information Platform or APPLAT, which is a one-stop shop for adaptation related information. At the national level, ADB is supporting our developing members to strengthen uh, adaptation dimension in its NDCs and build national capacity to translate adaptation priorities into investments. We have a technical assistance facility called NDC Advance for this. At the local level, ADB has recently launched a large scale program called Community Resilience Partnership Program or CRPP in partnership with the UK government and the Nordic Development Fund. The CRPP helps implement adaptation solutions in the local communities targeting the poorest populations and with a strong focus on gender equality. We strongly believe that successful adaptation requires local capacity. We need to put people and community at the heart of our climate actions. Second is to increase our support for adaptation investment. Between 2015 and 2020, ADB has provided $5.5 billion for adaptation finance from its own resources. Moving forward, we will strengthen our support to our developing member countries with concessional grant resources to undertake projects whose primary objective is to build resilience. This will be done through a thematic pool of funds to provide eligible countries with grant resources for climate adaptation. This fund will enable us to support capacity building of countries and implementations of innovative climate adaptation projects, such as nature-based solutions. 
These are priority for COP26 and a UN Biodiversity Conference. And third, lastly, is to improve system to better align our operation, ourselves in ADB with the Paris Agreement. ADB and other multilateral development banks or MDBs are working together on the methods for this. Regarding the adaptation goal of the Paris Agreement, the new methods built on ADB climate risk management framework, which has been in place since 2014. ADB is among the first MDBs to screen all, all of its investment against the climate change impact. So in the coming months, these methods will be tested and refined to ensure that over time, all ADB investments are systematically screened and assessed for climate risk. Our objective, our objective is to proactively promote adaptations in our member countries and in line with their national climate priorities and plans. So in closing, let's work together and ADB is open to work with all of you in scaling up climate actions on the ground. Thank you, maraming maraming salamat po. Over to you. Thank you very much and maraming salamat po, Dr. Susantono. And as always, when you're having wonderful, meaningful moments, there is never enough time. But we look forward to coming together again in the future very, very soon. And we are deeply grateful to each of our distinguished panel members today. Mrs. Elizabeth Marumamrema of CBD, Dr. Bambang Susantono of ADB, Mr. Obey Sarmad of the UNFCCC, Ms. Tina Burntili of the UNCCD, and His Excellency Ken O'Flaherty, COP26 Regional Ambassador to Asia Pacific and South Asia. Thank you so much for this wonderful, meaningful, and powerful discussion. We are all truly Thank grateful. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We would like to move on to a very special portion of our closing plenary, our visual storytelling to be presented by Miss Jennifer Katanyutanant. She works with interactive mediums like VR, installation, and food to facilitate communication and co-create systems of sharing and exchange. Recent fascinations include food systems research through sensory interactions playable critical thought and virtual spaces for shifting power imbalance. Past projects explored ecological manifestations of the YouTube recommendation algorithm, diverse creative communities in emerging technology and cultivating remote intimacy through food and web performance. Please give a warm welcome to independent artist and producer, Ms. Jennifer Katanyutanant. Hi everyone, thank you once again so much for the warm welcome. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just start sharing my screen here. So today I was, so today I'm here to talk about Walk Like a Bee, which is a new collaboration between myself, Siwagan Odachao, a Bakanya farmer and coffee producer and Invisible Flock a UK-based interactive art studio. This is an interactive walking experience that allows people to emotionally engage with the Bakunya forest through the lens of pollination and rotational farming. And um, initially, I was going to talk about the process of using storytelling to create an emotional connection. But instead of talking about storytelling, I thought it'd be better to just tell the story. And the most pressing one today is of Ban Ban Khoi Bon Dai Pen Din a forest in the western part of Thailand. 25 years ago, the Dai Pendin community was forced out of their ancestral home to make way for a national park. Their houses were burned and one of their community leaders, Billy, was killed, while the park rangers responsible did not face any repercussions for their actions. Earlier this year, they went back to their ancestral home to grow food. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, they've been unable to make an income from the usual tourist industry. Again, they faced violence. They were arrested, their hands were tied behind their backs, and for some, their heads were shaved. The picture on the right is of Kun Panapa Puxapan, the widow of murdered activist Billy, who says they use rules for dogs, not laws for humans. Today, I'd like to take this time to share the story of one woman, Kun Kip Panampet. She's one of 22 who was arrested and recently released only two days ago. If you don't kill me, let me go back home to Dai Pendin. If you don't let me go back home to Dai Pendin, just kill me. 
Don't put me in jail, kill me so I don't have to suffer like this. After less than an hour in a meeting with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, Cape Thonampet left the room in tears. I cried exhausted. I didn't say anything. I didn't believe him because I've heard it so many times. I've been disappointed so many times. I don't believe him 100%. And over 20 years ago, we were arrested. Billy disappeared. It hurts inside. I can't speak, she said in tears. She admits that hope is not yet exhausted, but it's close. He didn't understand what we wanted to tell him. We didn't get a chance to tell him because they don't listen. They won't let us return to Zaipen Din, where we were born and grew up. If we can't go back, I don't want to live at all. If I can't go back to my birthplace, I don't want to be here. Kill me once and for all. The minister said there was no violence during the arrest. We couldn't show photos because all our phones were confiscated. There was no other person we trusted allowed on the scene. We confirmed that they violently pulled us and tied our hands together behind our backs and pushed us up to the helicopters. We were so terrified. A medic gave her an analgesic bomb to treat her aching arms. She didn't use much. My heart hurts more than my body. We only want to go back to live with nature. The water is clear, the forest is cool. We want to continue our Pakinyaw way of life and culture and let our children learn the ethnic people's way, including our rotational farming system. We didn't damage the forest. If we did, the forest here would have gone bald a long time ago. We only live the way we are. We're happy with whatever we have. When we plant, there's no need to fetch water. We're proud of our natural farming system. We've never laid cement over soil. Look at the city, there's no soil left. With cement floors everywhere, even grass cannot grow. We've never done that. We let nature rehabilitate itself. We let the forest grow. Indigenous communities everywhere, uh, more than anyone, are leaders in adaptation. They've lived it, they've survived it, and they've been telling these stories for generations. And while art can be a very important tool for connecting these communities and connecting audiences around the world, I think an another very important tool is to listen to what's out there and listen to what they're saying. And so my ending thought for this forum is I hope you can all you know, start following local news and create relationships with the people that you're writing policy for and ideally writing policy with. My question for all of you is how can we create these spaces for listening and relating to what's going on? Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Jennifer Petan Yutanant, for that powerful presentation and, of course, for those stories that truly move our hearts into action. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And with that, it's time to move on to our third and final segment for the seventh APAN Closing Plenary. This session shall consist of two segments. The first will be commitments delivered by our key APAN partners to carry forward recommendations as appropriate and relevant to their organizations and to provide quick reflection on the 7th Asia Pacific Adaptation Forum. And of course, the second, the final segment for our high level closing session is a special message and vote of thanks to be delivered by the APAN Secretariat. The points to highlight for each of our partners' brief messages and commitments include what actions are we committing to? How will that help scaling up and resilience building? And to begin with this part of the session, we are honored to have with us Global Director, Nature-Based Solutions Group, International Union Conservation of Nature, IUCN, Mr. Stuart McGinnis. Well, thank you very much, uh, Antoinette. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Um, IUCN is delighted to present its commitments at the closing session of the 7th Asia Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Forum. And to help conclude what's been a successful week of sharing knowledge, opportunities and challenges for nature-based solutions to resilience. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in many countries within the Asia Pacific region, climate change is no longer an issue that can be considered imminent, some, something that will happen sometime in the near future. 
countries are already dealing with sea level rise, changing weather patterns, changing ecosystems, and periodic climate related impacts on domestic and international markets. The challenge of responding to these real and negative outcomes is now further compounded by the effects of, current, of the current COVID-19 pandemic. This is where we can leverage nature-based solutions for societal challenges. Interventions that not only address multiple societal challenges simultaneously, but also can contribute to recovery from COVID-19 and accelerate a societal shift to sustainability. As defined by IUCN in 2016, nature-based solutions are purposely designed approaches that protect, restore, and sustainably manage ecosystems in ways that deliver tangible and substantive benefits for people. While nature-based solutions have gained considerable traction, we must now work together to ensure that we do not squander this emerging opportunity. IUCN has therefore shifted its attention from promoting proof of concept pilots to driving scaled up policy, action and resource mobilization. We are therefore committing to support our state members, government agencies and other partners in two ways in particular. First, we commit to support partners who are taking policy and action to scale. We believe that many countries are now ready to take this critical next step, as demonstrated, for example, by Thailand's commitment to take its uh, ecosystem-based adaptation work in river basins to national level through codes of best practice. In supporting countries on scaling up, IUCN has already released the global standard for nature-based solutions. And I, I think a, 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 a link has been posted in the chat. Uh, for those who are interested. As a next step from establishing this uh, standard, IUCN is now putting in place and establishing a global facility for nature-based solutions aimed at enhancing national capacities to optimize application of the standard. The facility will work through a number of regional and national MBS hubs established in partnership with national governments. In this respect, we welcome the recently announced IUCN China Asia Regional Hub in partnership with the Ministry of Natural Resources of China. We are also in the early discussions for a national hub in Japan and will be coordinating this with the Ministry uh, for Environment, uh, our hosts for the seventh APAN Forum. The Japanese Ministry of Environment has been IUCN's leading partner and donor for uh, ecosystem disaster risk reduction collaboration that began in the last decade following the great East Japan earthquake and tsunami, which we observed, uh, the 10th anniversary of which we observed yesterday. Secondly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, deploying nature-based solutions at scale will only be possible if financing is aligned with the NBS opportunities. Uh, the launch of Pakistan's Ecosystem Restoration Fund at COP25 in Madrid is a great example of such alignment. Therefore, in supporting countries to access financing for MBS, IUCN is working to mobilize private sector funding at scale. Most recently, through the design and launch of two highly innovative MBS private investment funds. Those are the Nature Plus Accelerator, managed by Merova, and in collaboration with Pegasus Capital, BNP Paribas, the Gold Standard, and R20, the Subnational Climate Fund. These two blended finance funds for MBS have a combined value of over $1 billion, with IUCN acting as the lead technical advisor. We would be happy to support the design and launch of similar opportunities within Asia Pacific for MBS financing. Similarly, IUCN has been working to support mobilization of public sector funding through our accreditation to the Global Environment, uh, the Global Environment Facility and the Green Climate Fund, we have been supporting countries in mobilizing MBS-aligned funding. In this respect, IUCN has worked with its state members to mobilize a portfolio of almost 600 million in approved and pipeline uh, projects uh, designed to deliver MBS at scale. We look forward to working with our 26 uh, state members in the Asia Pacific region to further unlock international funding for MBS at scale. With these, with these remarks, ladies and gentlemen, a sincere thank you for engagement in the 7th APAN uh, meeting, and we look forward to working together with you on nature-based solutions for resilience building in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. Stuart McGinnis, Global Director, Nature-Based Solutions Group, International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN. And now we hear the pledges and commitments from the Center Director of the Stockholm Environment Institute, Asia, SEI. We are honored to have with us, Mr. Niall O'Connor. Good afternoon, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at the end of this forum, and it was certainly a very invigorating week with lots of great information. As you know, this week, SEI, along with my colleagues, Albert and Nicole, who are here also, uh, focused on inclusive resilience. And we heard from a variety of women, men, youths, and other advocates of marginalized or minority groups from across the region, underlining the importance of inclusive resilience in climate actions. We are excited that APAN has a platform to bring together such a broad range of individuals working to build resilience of the communities and making sure that their voices are heard. While this is a step in the right direction, we're still at the beginning of making sure that everyone has a seat at the table um, and to ensure that no one is left behind in the various climate actions and sustainable development dialogues or in delivery that we want to plan. Uh, this week, um, I think we uncovered a few key areas where further action is critical. First, I think resilience is not possible without justice. Governments should provide space for activism, youths, women, indigenous people, people with disabilities, and people who, these are not people that are risks, they are sources of resilience. And democracy should be pursued to enable their voices to be represented in decision-making. Second, governance is key. In the last decades, there's been a strong push for more inclusive policies. And while many governments have a range of policies on paper, especially for climate change adaptation and women's empowerment, the challenge is in its implementation. We need to focus on implementation and support that. Structural barriers continue to exclude and marginalize many women, indigenous people, people with disabilities and others. And if this patriarchy continues to undermine women's equality, let's address it head on and now, let's not wait. We cannot continue to use it as a context for our actions, but rather it should be the objective of our actions. We need to make that change. Third, while we agree that there is a strong need for adaptation finances, we need to find better ways to ensure that those most impacted by climate change are able to access climate funds equitably and to facilitate their capacity building and ultimately contribute to their resilience building initiatives. All too often, it doesn't get to the most vulnerable communities. That needs to change. Fourth, we should be building on the many ongoing initiatives that are being led by women, by indigenous people, by people with disabilities, by farmers, fisheries, or other people stigmatized due to their occupations to help foster resilience practice that is truly inclusive and adaptive. And this should be alongside current and well-intended initiatives that are ongoing by other people, not, not separate to it. The fifth, I think we need to ensure that adaptation efforts are in line with human rights obligations and the global commitments of countries in the region, such as the effective implementation of the SDGs and doing so in a manner that ensures we leave no one behind. As some of you may know, SEI, we aim to bridge science, policy, and best practice. We are an evidence-based research institute that produces usable knowledge. And as such, we want to underscore our continued commitment to amplifying the challenges, the solutions, and the actions taking place on the ground to ensure that policymakers, donors, and other actors, they hear the full story and know who needs to have a seat at the table to design our future. SEI also commits to uncovering the root causes of vulnerability and to make sure that resilience building efforts are not superficial nor redistribute inequality. So going forward, we will continue our work in ensuring gender and social equity, advocating for the inclusion of human rights-based approaches in climate change policies and national adaptation planning, and advocate for the inclusive approaches for all in climate decision-making. In the coming weeks, months, and years, we look forward to partnering with many of you that have been active in this week's event so as to make sure that in our discussions, in our practices, uh, moving forward, we leave no one behind. But finally, I think we also need to break from the traditional discussions with the converted. Many of us in this event here already, already agree with each other on what's been discussed. Um, but as my mother used to say, self-praise is no praise. So how do we get beyond this and move past this? How do we get others involved in the dialogue to learn from other people, to work together with other people and to see how they lead by example? and to get to those people who make the very tough decisions that we're gonna to have to make. How do we get all the stakeholders and private sectors, government people, the key individual decision makers, along with civil society, 
as key partners in this dialogue, committing to action-oriented, solution-oriented, lasting change for a sustainable and green future. And you know, I like to, I, we hear a lot of discussions focusing on the youth and their tomorrow and how they're going to help manage this crisis. But why are we leaving them a crisis in the first place? You know, we used to be young once; we should know better. And for me, I think those two key areas are going to be the key challenges for APAN moving forward. How do we get the real decision makers beyond the converted? We know the problems. How do we get those who don't know and don't believe behind this transition of change? And how do we make sure we don't just leave it all for the youth to deliver on? We have a responsibility. Uh, thank you. And I look forward to continuing working with you in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Niall O'Connor, SCI. And now we are going to hear from another key APAN partner, Ms. Akiko Yamamoto, Regional Team Leader, Nature, Climate and Energy Team, UN Development Program, UNDP. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to be with you with the fellow APAN partners. What I heard from various part, uh, participants throughout the week, including UN Secretary General of Envoy for Youth, is a commitment to jointly change the status quo and make our adaptation efforts more effective and meaningful. Messages from different stakeholders and the ideas to improve the current adaptation paradigm, they are truly encouraging. Time is running out. We are in the decade of action. We all must do our part to realize this uh, change now. Let me start with our ongoing commitment called the Climate Promise Initiative, which is supporting more than 100 countries globally in realizing their climate ambitions in their nationally determined contributions. Many governments across the region have set adaptation actions as a center pillar of, our, of the NDCs. This reflects the reality of the region. UNDP will certainly reflect all the messages and lessons from this rich discussion this week in our ongoing climate promise support to 27 countries in the region. The region faces unprecedented threats from climate change, underlining socioeconomic challenges further heightened a local level vulnerability. On top of all that, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has left the vulnerable within our society even more vulnerable. In the face of all these uh, escalating risks, a major shift is needed to accelerate and target necessary investments to build resilience, and especially among the most vulnerable. On the concluding day of the seventh APAN Forum, I would like to express UNDP's renewed commitment to advancing and scaling up local -led, locally led adaptation in the region. To scale up, we need a paradigm shift, adequate investment, and appropriate knowledge and strong partnership. We believe that the, the principle for locally led adaptation, which were presented in January this year and endorsed by more than 40 organizations, that can be a major driver to catalyze this paradigm shift. The principle urged us to set up enabling conditions to bring the most vulnerable communities to the center stage of adaptation actions and to define the future of our ad adaptation landscape. UNDP fully endorses this principle, these principles and integrate them throughout our work, not just uh, through our climate change portfolio, but also our nature and energy portfolio. In terms of investment, during the session on the financing, uh, finance enablers in the communities and local resilience stream, we discussed how we need to change our mindset to better embrace the risks of failure in community level adaptation actions. We also discussed how current model of mobilizing resources is poorly fit to support community level actions. Currently, from the conception to the implementation of actions on the ground, it can easily take more than a year, while the farmers and their families are facing crop failure from yet another drought. 
as we move forward, UNDP will continue to explore options to respond to urgent needs at the community level in close dialogue with climate financing institutions, trying to enhance the flexibility of adaptation financing. As to appropriate knowledge, we heard throughout the week the importance of traditional and indigenous knowledge. In the past, only a token recognition was paid to such knowledge, and we have not invested in systematically understanding such a body of knowledge. This is a new area of actions that UNDP will pay much closer attention to, and uh, we will certainly reflect this in our adaptation support. On partnership, we very much value being part of this APAN community. Working together with APAN partners and communities will help all of us bring greater, more integrated, and more impactful investment to the communities and scale up community led actions. We very much look forward to continued engagement with our work stream partners. And to all the community leaders and government leaders and partners who are with us today, we hope to work closely with you to cement the paradigm shift towards locally led resilience across the region. We also hope that the momentum achieved at this regional forum can be further strengthened at national and subnational levels to foster traditional and local institutions and to build enduring resilience as we march towards an inclusive, equitable and sustainable world for all. Last but not least, I would like to extend our appreciation to the Minister of Environment of the Government of Japan for their continued support and, continue, and commitment to main, maintaining this uh, spaceful dialogue through the APAN network and forum. Over the last seven years, uh, this forum has certainly established itself as one of the most important platforms, governments, practitioners, NGOs, CSOs, and the private sectors and other I think we may have lost um, Ms. Yamamoto of UNDP. Um, we hope that we can reconnect with her, but with that, we thank her so much for her pledges and commitments as one of our valuable partners, of course, for APAN. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Yamamoto, UNDP. And now we proceed to our next valuable partner, and of course, a message from them, Mr. Drupad Chaduri. Chief Scaling Operations International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, ICI MOD. Mr. Chaduri. Thank you very much, Antonin. It's a pleasure to be here. After a week which has been very informative, inspiring, and invigorating, um, we have learned a lot across uh, you know, different enablers. Uh, during the whole week. And what came out, my takeaway of the week was the enthusiasm, the spirit through which people have presented and given us many very insightful, uh, you know, uh, views about not just the status, the challenges which are there, but also the solutions which can be brought about. With that background, it's my pleasure to make the commitments on behalf of the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. And the commitments are three. Let me start with the first one. ISIMOD commits to bridging knowledge gaps on climate risk and vulnerabilities in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region in generating increased understanding of the implications for the people in the region and downstream, and to disseminate the knowledge generated through mechanisms such as the Nairobi Work Program and Lima Adaptation Knowledge Initiative platforms of the UNFCCC, and also the Hindu Kush Himalayan Science and Policy Forum set in motion by EC Mode to better inform climate action and strengthen informed efforts for inclusive 
resilience build. Second, continue to pilot innovative approaches for resilient solutions to the challenges arising from climate risk and vulnerabilities, particularly to vulnerable and marginal communities such as indigenous people and women in mountain areas in partnership with civil society and communities. As the regional implementing entity of the Adaptation Fund, we will support all countries in the region to design and implement pilots that test effective approaches for climate action aimed at enhancing inclusive resilience and foster alliances with national governments and development partners to take such solutions to scale. Finally, developing strong partnerships and political will for collective action to translate the Hindu Kush Himalayan call to action, endorsed and signed by the ministers of the age Himalayan countries at the Ministerial Mountain Summit held in October 2020. Through strengthened regional cooperation and the establishment of a permanent regional mechanism for collective action, raising a common voice at global fora, and call for increased investment to support urgent and effective action that protects the pulse of the planet or the HKH region while fostering inclusive resilience building. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chaudhuri. And now we hear from another valuable APAN partner, Mr. Yasuo Takahashi, Executive Director, Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, IGES. Uh, thank you, Antoinette, for your kind introduction. And uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. Uh, first of all, let me express, express my uh, congratulations on the successful con completion uh, of the, this APAM forum. I just, I just was one of the forum session partners and part of the forum organizing team. And on behalf of my institute, I would like to thank all the participants and the stakeholders joining this forum. This week long forum featured many comprehensive and useful discussions on the regional uh, plenary session, regional climate change adaptation issues with four streams comprising plenary sessions and technical sessions, as well as several special events. I just contributed as an institute and on an individual basis, working together with our partners for technical sessions and one special event. I just was uh, particularly involved in organizing a technical session yesterday together with Jap Japanese Minister of the Environment on the sub subject of status and challenges for linking scientific knowledge to strengthening so socioeconomic resilience to climate-related disasters. The session reached a con consensus on the need to strengthening, strengthen adaptive capacity and build evidence-based knowledge on climate risks. Multi-stakeholder collaboration and the partnership in the region was also reported as a priority issue. We agree that the Japanese government's recent initiative, the Asia Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Information Platform, or APPLAT, can contribute to the, uh, this, uh, to these challenges. I believe that our technical session Session's key message can make an important contribution to the forum's action-oriented recommendation for adapt, 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 adoption issue, adaptation issues in, in the Asia Pacific region. I just very much hope to be part of APAN's commitment through our future activities and contribute to the step change in stronger uh, partnership and knowledge exchange in this region. Among others, Japan's State Minister of the Environment, Mr. Sasagawa, pointed out in the, the importance of APPLAT in the opening ceremony with its three pillars of, of activities. These are development, uh, sorry. 
development of scientific information, provision of adaptation tools, and provision of capacity building. So the first two pillars as in, inter, introduced in a technical session organized by the Asia Pacific Network for Global Change Research, or APN, a network hosted by AGIS. The National Institute uh, for Environmental Studies is making the latest scientific knowledge and tools available for a wide range of stakeholders. IGES is also working to consolidate, coordinate the pillar on capacity building. And last week, we organized the kickoff workshop for this initiative, targeting training institutions, research institutions, international and regional organizations that provide uh, training and ad on adaptation in the Pacific Asia Pacific region. The workshop was a ch chance to discuss future activities on capacity development and the AP plat. The results of those discussions were reported in yesterday's panel special session. We must maintain this momentum with our partners to encourage climate risk informed decision making and the practical adaptation action across the region. We would be delighted to welcome any interested parties to join this initiative. IDIS is also now implementing the ASEAN project on this disaster risk reduction, integrating climate change projection into full flood and landslide risk assessment. We com completed the first phase of this project in December 2020 and produced guidelines for landslide and food flood risk assessment and mapping, taking into consideration climate change impact for better land use planning based on pilot projects in Myanmar and Laos. These guidelines are now official documents endorsed by ASEM. The next phase will look mainly on how to apply these guidelines to other ASEAN countries. So these are the IGS's major future commitments for the region. We will continue to monitor progress and we will we'll take every opportunity going forward to report on, this, uh, on the results and share the outputs and lessons learned. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Takahashi-san. Arigato gozaimasu. Executive Director for IGES. And now, we hear from another valuable partner, Ms. Isabel Lewis, Deputy Regional Director, UN Environment Program, Asia and the Pacific Office. Thank you, Internet, and excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening uh, to all of you. Joining us from various parts of the world, at the end of this very stimulating uh, week of rich discussions, sharing and exchange, on behalf of UNEP and the APAN Secretariat, I wish to express my sincere gratitude to all APAN key partners, exceptional speakers, session leads, and the technical logistics teams for facilitating the successful delivery of the program for the 7th Asia-Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Forum. Participants to the forum not only repeatedly reiterated the urgency to step up, but also provided essential resilient solutions pathways for scaling up integrated approaches and optimizing many platforms with collective and inclusive engagement of all stakeholders. UNEP continues to be committed to be an active partner in these essential pathways for climate resilient solutions. The fifth UN Environment Assembly at the end of May, end of February, sorry, endorsed the UNEP's medium term strategy 2022 to 2025, which will support member states in stepping up actions to address the three areas of planetary crisis actions for climate, for nature, and for pollution in an integrated approach. The Asia Pacific Adaptation Network will be an essential and important platform in the implementation of the strategy with its partners. 
to continue our collective climate resilience solutions journey with all of you and with the key messages taken from this forum, UNEP will first facilitate stronger partnerships, knowledge exchange and networking platforms to ensure that best practices and solutions highlighted at the forum are consistently available for replication and magnification. This will include ensuring ongoing APAN communities of practice, the Asia Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Information Platform, APPLAT engagement, but with particular attention to enabling spaces for youth and vulnerable communities to engage and be empowered. Secondly, UNEP will bring the messages of climate resilience and financing to scale up from this forum to UNEP's dialogue and planning when UNEP engages with governments, partners, and the financing sectors to drive mobilization of investments for resilience. This will be by influencing wider and larger investment portfolios for development, mm -hmm. infrastructure, green recovery, private financing, capacity building, to internalize climate resilience impact. And finally, UNEP will facilitate partnership dialogues, investments, and collective activities that scale up capacity building for practitioners, investors, policymakers, communities, and youth to deliver climate resilience impact. UNEP is very proud and privileged to host the APAN Secretariat, and we thank you once again for your active participation and continued support to the APAN Network. And we all look forward to a face-to-face -face eighth APAN forum. And thank you once again. Thank you very much, Ms. Isabel Lewis, Deputy Regional Director, UN Environment Program, Asia and the Pacific Office. Of course, a key APAN partner. And finally, the commitments and messages from another key APAN partner, Mr. Kazuaki. Takahashi, Director of Climate Change Adaptation Office, Global Environment Bureau, Ministry of the Environment of Japan. Thank you, Antoinette, and good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. Uh, we are almost at the end of one week journey, and we appreciate much efforts by APAN Secretariat and UNEP, uh, EDB, IUCN, SEA, SEI, UNDP, ISMOT, APAN Forum Organization Team, and IGES for supporting this wonderful forum. Throughout the five days of the forum, there were various discussions on concrete actions for climate change adaptation from four streams and five enablers matrices. Japan focused on the Asia Pacific Adaptation Information Platform called APPLAT which was announced in 2019. In order to accelerate the imp implementation of adaptation projects, we will process scientific knowledge on climate change into risk information tools that can be used in developing countries and promote international cooperation that will lead to action on the ground. We also introduced the message that Japan announced to the world last June, climate action and disaster risk reduction. In this message, we introduced the adaptive recovery and the ancient wisdom of INASU as deal weather disasters skill free. We also received a video message from Her Excellency Jean Makasi, US National Climate Advisor at a Wednesday's morning garden event which was co-hosted by Japan. The message was a powerful one about Biden administration's return to the Paris Agreement to confront climate change for achieving climate justice. Ministry of Environment Japan, in cooperation with other partners, will promote technological cooperation for adaptation to countries that are more vulnerable to climate change such as the least developed countries and small island nations. In the past, a Pan Forum was an opportunity for those who are involved in adaptation to meet face to face. But this year's forum was held online, 
which allowed us for deep discussions that led to actual actions. As organizer, Japan would like to provide an outcome document that summarizes the outcomes of the four streams so that this, the forum discussions can contribute to COP26 and CBD COP15. The outcome document and recordings of all sessions will be achieved, uh, archived on the up, up website for anyone to refer to again and again. We believe that the process and result of this forum should be very important common property. And I hope we keep this momentum for scaling up adaptation actions. I look forward to seeing you somewhere in the next uh, two years. Thank you, and back to you. Thank you very, very much. We are honored to hear your message. Mr. Kazuaki Takahashi, Director of Climate Change Adaptation Office, Global Environment Bureau, Ministry of the Environment of Japan. And we are deeply grateful to each and every one of our key APAN partners for their invaluable support and leadership. And now for a special closing message and vote of thanks, I am deeply honored to introduce Mr. Muzaharul Alam, Head of APAN Secretariat and Climate Change Coordinator, United Nations Environment Program, Asia and the Pacific Office. Mr. Muzaharul Alam joined the United Nations Environment Program in 2009, serving as Regional Coordinator, Climate Change for Asia and the Pacific Office. He provides strategic and technical guidance for the design and implementation of climate change actions. Before joining UNEP, he worked for Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies and led climate change programs. He also served as the Ministry of Environment and Forests, Government of Bangladesh as a national project coordinator and successfully formulated the National Adaptation Program of Action following an inclusive process. To deliver a vote of thanks on behalf of the APAN Secretariat and APAN partners, Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Muzharul Alam Omar Babu as he is on the um, <clears throat> Thank you, Antoniette, uh, for giving, I think, the full bios of mine. <laughs> and, and I'm standing colleagues and friends uh, between my vote of thanks and, and happy hour um, that uh, probably started already. Uh, dear participants and speakers, you have made possible delivering a successful 7th Asia-Pacific Adaptation Forum. You have identified number of critical steps to build resilience. It is your achievement during the last five days. You, we have more than 900 unique participants and speakers during the entire week. If I look into the daily count, it ranges between 320 to 400 plus. So on behalf of Asia Pacific Adaptation Network, its secretariat and our partners, please accept my heartfelt thanks for helping us and delivering this successful forum. Let me also thank uh, the moderators. Your role during East Plenary and the technical session was vital. You have helped us in deepening discussion in many complex issues related to climate change, and it touches all sectors of our society. No one untasked, and therefore we cannot leave anyone behind, and the masses we have received as a part of the summary is inclusive transformation. And through your, the, the moderation, we able to bring out that messages. So again, on behalf of the APAN Secretariat and its partner, please accept our sincere thanks and appreciation for your support. Their stream leaders and the session partners, we had the six, the stream leads and the 28, the partners who provided um, 
the support in designing and delivering the technical sessions during this adaptation forum. We as the APAN Secretariat and also the government of Japan as a host of this forum, we fully recognize your tireless effort in designing and delivering the 20 technical session, three special events and one side event. In addition to the seven, the plenary sessions that APAN Secretariat delivered with your support. I also would like to thank the stream leads in addition to deliver the technical session for delivering four resilience outlook. They are participant. These resilience outlooks are available in APAN forum website, as well as this is the conference, the platform, which is Huvilo. Thank you for your great help and, and continued support to APAN forum. APAN will continue counting on your support in advancing many recommendations presented today. There are 40 exhibit exhibitors in the marketplace. Thank you very much for showing your work through the marketplace and staying with us throughout the week. A very special thanks to you all. Let me also mention the advisory group members who provided uh, the support and guiding the APAN Secretariat and stream lead uh, in designing and delivering this forum. Please accept our, our thanks for guiding us throughout this preparation, as well as contributing during delivering this forum. Their technical design team, IT support team, and also the interpreter sitting in, in Japan. Thank you also for your support in delivering the seventh Asia Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Forum fully virtual and without having a technical bliss was a dream for me, but you have made it. And a very special thanks for entire technical design and IT team and the interpreter and a very, very special thanks to Harmas for leading the team and delivering the forum in a fully virtual mode. Their communication team of the partners organization, I cannot thank you enough as you have helped upon forum to reach out more than I have been told 7 million people through the Facebook, the Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. A special thanks to ADB communication team from the very start of the upon forum in terms of helping us registering and also running the pre-forum of uh, the webinars. A special thanks to the ADB, the communication team. Let me express uh, our sincere thanks and gratitude to the Ministry of Environment uh, Japan for hosting this AFAN forum and also providing support to all the stream leads in delivering uh, this seventh uh, forum. Uh, also, I'd like to thank the technical team provided support to the Ministry of Environment Japan, including IGS uh, in the different capacity and making this forum a success. Let me also thank my colleague in APAN Secretariat uh, for tireless effort, especially Sarah, you, mm -hmm. and, and my other UNEP colleagues in the regional office, including Deshen and Isabel, for their continued guidance, as well as my admin and the finance support team, uh, as well as the communication team in the office supporting us, and also the colleagues in the headquarter and the division, so also extended support in delivering the forum. I also would like to thanks the UNF, uh, the UNCC, the conference, the facility team, providing the technical support and keeping us connected in the last five days, and and making it uh, flawless in terms of the internet connection. Thanks to my colleague in UN, 
uh, CC, um, the conference facility. Dear participants, let me end by informing you that the first summary of the seventh Asia Pacific Adaptation Forum will be available next week through the IISD, the reporting service, and thanks to the IIED reporting service as well for capturing the messages along with the visual, the, uh, the, the capture through the artist as well as the Drupal who double up the drops. The final, the APAN forum summary will be shared with you probably in two weeks time in a proper graphics design and et cetera. So with that, I'm thanking, if I left anyone, please accept our gratitude and thanks for helping us delivering the seventh Asia Pacific Adaptation Forum in full virtual mode. Thank you once again, stay safe, stay well, and enjoy happy hour virtually. Over to you, Antonieta. Thank you so much, Babu, Mr. Muzaharul Alam, head of the APAN Secretariat and Climate Change Coordinator, UNEP Asia in the Pacific Office. And ladies and gentlemen, with that, we officially close the seventh Asia Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Forum. We thank you all once again for all that you do to create a better world for people on the planet, and most especially for the most vulnerable of us. With great thanks and gratitude to our hosts, for the seventh APAN Forum, the Ministry of Environment, Government of Japan. And once again, on behalf of the APAN Secretariat and the United Nations Environment Program, Asia Pacific, and all of our key APAN partners, we share our infinite gratitude to our most distinguished and honorable speakers, champions of the earth, and of course, to everyone streaming live across the world. I am Antoinette Toss, Goodwill Ambassador for UNEP, and deeply honored to have been your host and moderator for this most meaningful closing plenary. We wish you bountiful blessings of good health, peace, and love wherever you are, and we look forward to seeing you all in person at the 8th Asia Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Forum. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone again for attending the 7th Asia Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Forum. Please do join us for our final post event session, which is happy hour and karaoke night, which is beginning right now. I have dropped the link into the chat so you can go ahead and click that link right now to join. Antoinette will be kicking us off at that event. Otherwise, please do continue the conversation on social media using the hashtag APAN2020. And once again, thank you so much for your participation, your perspectives, and your experiences. Have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world.